Hi, so in this video, which is going to be kind of a multi pound, it's going to be at least two pounds. But in this video, I'm going to start looking at data classes and explaining data classes and how they work, not just show you how to create data classes or classes using the data classes syntax. So in this notebook, in this video, we're going to explore data classes and their correspondence to code that we might write when implementing classes using plain old vanilla Python instead of the data class syntax. So the first question, I guess, is what are data classes? Well, data classes were introduced in Python 3.7, but what are they? Is it a new type of data structure, a new type of object? I think there's a, you know, sometimes a common misconception, especially amongst beginner Python developers, that this is something new. And the answer is no, there's nothing new with data classes. Uh, what a data class is, it's a code generator. It basically generates standard Python classes and allows us to do that using a different syntax than we might write if we're using plain old vanilla, you know, Python. And it basically abstracts away the need to write what's called boilerplate code. It's code that is repetitive, basically always works the same way. You just keep writing the same thing. It's boring. You can make mistakes and so on. So if you've used name tuples before, either in the collections module or in the typing module for the more modern version with the type hinting, you've seen code generators because that's exactly what those are as well. They're a code generator. So before you start using data classes, you really need to understand classes in Python and you need to understand things like equality and hashing and ordering because data classes kind of takes care of that plumbing for you. But in order to use the data class correctly and effectively, you need to understand how it's implementing those things behind the scenes. And it's opaque. We don't really see the code that the data class is generating. So you have to kind of learn that. And this is what this video and set of videos is going to be about. It's going to be about understanding what the data class is actually doing behind the scenes. So there's a lot more information that I have. It's in the notebook that's in the GitHub repo. It's linked below. If you want to go ahead and take a look at that, I give the, the link to the pep. I also talk a little bit about the history of data classes, one of the main inspirations for data classes and why it became part of the standard Python library was because of the Atters library that was started by a gentleman by the name of Heinek Schlawak, if I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. And it became very popular and people wanted to start getting this into the standard library. So a conversation started between Heinek and Eric Smith and basically that's how data classes was born. And so data classes is actually a subset, a simplifying subset of the Atters library. So I have a link to that and you can go and take a look also at the Atters library because it's like data classes, but with a lot more functionality. So Atters is still very much relevant today. Anyway, I dig into all that. Uh, thank the author of the Atters repo and the collaborators because they really did and keep doing a great job. It is still very much an actively developed library. Okay, so with that aside, let's go ahead and actually start digging into data classes. Now, please note I'm using Python 3.11 for these examples because since Python 3.7, data classes have evolved. They are evolving very slowly, not like Adders. Adders evolves much faster, obviously, because it's not part of the standard Python release cycle. So as the name data classes would seem to indicate, data classes are classes and they're really used for data structures. So you wouldn't use a data class to do something, for example, like a custom iterator or maybe a context manager or things like that. That's, that's not what they're for, right? They're really for basically combining fields together as a data structure. And of course, you can use regular classes to do that. You can use name tuples as well but you can use regular classes too. And this is really the goal of data classes is to make it simpler with writing less code to create those kinds of classes that are going to be basically for holding data. So as an example, I'm going to create a two dimensional circle class that needs attributes for its origin, the X and Y, and then also something for its attribute. 
And I'm going to use integers instead of floats, just so we don't have to worry about, you know, equality comparisons with floats, because there we might want to be a little bit more careful. So I'm going to create a regular class, right? So I'm going to draw a parallel between what you would need to write in a regular Python class, and then compare that to the data class to show you what code it's written for us. So when we create the circle, well, we're going to need an init because we need to pass it the X, which will type annotate. So we'll say it's an int. The default is zero. We need a Y. Again, the default is going to be zero and it's an int. And then for the radius, again, we'll make an int and then we're going to set that default equal to one. So that's our initializer. And then we're just going to set attributes directly on the instance. So we'll say self.x equals x, self.y equals y, and self.radius equals radius, like so. So we have this circle class. We can go ahead and create an instance of circle. And you can see that we have a default wrapper representation for the circle, which is this. And that comes obviously from the object class. So we probably would want to add some functionality to this particular class. In particular, the first thing that we probably should add is the wrapper. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement a wrapper. And very often, and I'm guilty of doing the same thing, I might return something like this, return an F string, and then I'll say circle, and then I'll pass in what I want, you know, interpolate what I want. So here I want self.x, then I want y equals self.y, something like this. So I might make this my wrapper, but this isn't the best idea. This is not best practice. What we really should do is to interpolate class uh, s dunder. And now, you know, if you're going to that extra step of doing it this way, very often I'll see name being used here as well. That's fine, but that's equally not best practice. What's better is to use qual name, because if you've got an inheritance chain, the qual name is going to show you that inheritance chain as well, which the other one with the name would only show you circle or whatever class you happen to be in if you've subclassed circle. Okay, so this is the better practice is to do it this way. So now we've got the wrapper. So again, we can create a circle with all the defaults. And if we look at the wrapper, for the circle, now we get this representation over here. Great. So you saw that this is what I consider boilerplate. It's basically going to be the same thing. We're going to return an F string. We're going to use the class qual name. And then in here, we're going to put in whatever attributes we want. We may choose to put all the attributes or only some of the attributes. Here, I only put some. So let me go ahead and add the other one, self.radius. I want all of them in there. Okay, so if I do this, now I have the radius as well. So what we can do is we can create this class circle again. So we're just going to create a regular class. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class variable and I'm going to type annotate it and I will set it a default. So this is now a class variable, right? These are not instance variables anymore. And then we'll do the same thing with radius and then, but we'll set the default to one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to import from data classes. I'm going to import data class. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to decorate the circle class. So of course I can use the decorator syntax, or I could also just do it this way. I could say data class circle. And I'll come back to that. But this is another way of doing of applying a decorator. The short way is doing this. Okay, so we'll do that and take that out. So now this data class decorator has modified this class, it's taken the circle class, it's looked at it's basically introspected the circle class, and it's made modifications to it. So now if we make an instance of the circle class, and you know what, I'm going to call it circle D, so that it's circle data class, and I'll keep this one, the circle for the one that's the just the plain vanilla Python class. So we'll make an instance of circle D. And then we'll look at what C is. 
So I'll call these not defined because I didn't execute that. Let's do that again. Okay, so you can see that we got this wrapper that basically came for free. We didn't have to write all this code, right? We didn't have to put in this implementation. The data class did that for us. Moreover, see the X and Y are no longer class attributes. They are now instance attributes. So I can say C.X equals 100. If we look at C again, you can see that the circle D is this. We can look at the dictionary of the instance and you can see that it has X, Y, and radius. These are now instance variables. So if we were to create another object, C2 equals circle D, and then I do C2.Y equals negative one, and then I look at C2, you can see that C2 has that and C1 has not changed, or it was just called C. C hasn't changed, right? It's still 100, zero. So the data class was nice. It gave us the wrapper and it also used best practices. Now, as far as attribute access, both classes, both the data class defined class and the regular standard class work the same way with the attributes. We've got these mutable attributes and so on. Now, remember what I said that the decorator basically just modifies this class over here. Let's just take a look at that. So I'm going to take this code without the data class. We're going to recreate it here. And now I'm going to get the ID. So let's do the hex code of the ID of circle D, right? And then if we, so we can do that. And if we look at C equals circle D, and then we just look at C, we get that original wrapper, right? Now let's go ahead and say circle D equals data class, and we'll pass it the original class circle D. And now we can look at the ID of circle D, right? Circle D being what came back from this data class function or this decorator function. And you can see it's exactly the same object. The object hasn't changed, right? The ID of the object hasn't changed, but the class itself has been mutated because now if we look at an instance of circle D and we look at the wrapper, you can see that the wrapper function essentially was added to our class as if we had written it ourselves, like we did over here. So hopefully you're starting to understand what data classes are. A data class is a decorator that basically modifies the class. It's a class decorator. Now there is one place where that's not exactly the case and that's when we use slots. When we use slots, then we'll actually get a new class back, not the original you know, class that was being decorated. And that's because once you create a class, you cannot switch between using slots and not using slots on the fly at runtime. So the, the, the decorator would not be able to change that aspect of the class. So it has to recreate a new class that then enables slots and then gives you that thing back. And we'll take a look at slots in the context of data classes a little later. Okay, so now let's take a look at equality comparisons because that's something else that we also get for free essentially with data classes. If we look at our original class, circle, right? We just called it circle. So if I create this circle over here and I create another circle over here, now everything's defaulted, but let me change the defaults. Let's say one, one, one and one, 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 okay? So these are instances of that circle class, that, that custom Python class that we wrote. If we look at C1 equals C2, we get false because by default, I didn't specify what, you know, what equality comparison means or how it's defined for the circle class. So by default, it uses the equality from the object class, it inherits that. In the object class, equality falls back to using the identity. So if C1 is not the same object as C2, then the equality will also come back as false. Obviously, the is C2 is definitely gonna be false because they're not the same object, but equality as well. Often what we want is we wanna say no, based on the state of the instance, that's what I wanna to use to see if, it's, if they're equal. And of course, if we want to do that in our own class, well, we're going to have to implement that. And I'll show you that in a second. 
But if we go back to our circle D class, right? So this one over here, but the decorated one, so the data class, circle D, if we say C1 equals circle D111, and we say C2 equals circle D111, then you can see that C1 and C2 are not the same object. That's, that's right. But if we look at C1 equal to C2, that is true. So the data class gives us this equality for free, essentially. Now, how does it do it? Well, let's go and actually implement the equality ourselves for our custom class. So we'll go back. We'll take this class over here and we're going to add more code. So now we have to define the equality, right? Between self and other. So best practice is to check the data type. So we're going to say if self class is equal to other class. So we're only going to compare a circle to another circle. Then we're going to return what? How do we want to compare? Well, I want to compare based on the X, Y and radius properties. So I'm going to return basically the comparison between the tuple self.x, self.y, self.radius. Okay, so I'm going to look at this tuple made up of the state of this class. And I'm going to see if it's equal to other.x, other.y, other.radius. So basically, I'm building this tuple from self and from other based on the state of the objects and then comparing that. And if I'm not comparing to another circle class, then I'm going to return not implemented. And then we'll see if maybe reflection, maybe the other class will implement comparison to the circle class. But as the circle class, I'm not going to do it. So I'll just return not implemented. Again, just another best practice. So now let's try it out with our custom class. So we do circle 111. We do C2 equals circle 111. So now we have two different objects, right? Just as before. And now, however, we do get the equality that we're looking for. So again, the data class gave us this for free. Okay, so when we talk about equality, we also really have to talk about hashability. When we implement a custom EQ method, we often also implement hashability as well. And I discussed that in my deep dive series and all the notebooks are freely available on GitHub. There's a link in this notebook that points you to the GitHub repo that has all the notebooks for all the uh, code videos in the deep dive series on Udemy. So you don't have to buy the series, you can just read the code there. And it's fully annotated notebooks just like these are. So I'm not going to discuss the reasons between, you know, behind why do we want hashability? Why would, do we want that when we create the EQ method, when we override the EQ method and so on. So with our current implementation, the circle class is not hashable. If I try and say hash of C1, that's not going to work, right? I get an unhashable type. And in fact, if I use the circle D instance, so if I'm using the data class, and I try and hash that, I get the same thing as well. I get an unhashable type. So by default, data classes are not hashable. All right, so let's take our custom class and implement hashability. Let's see how that is actually done. We basically can override the hash function. And we now need to provide something that's going to be the hash for this class. So here I'm doing my comparison based on X, Y and radius. So I'm going to make my hash consistent with that. So I'm going to return the hash of the tuple self.x, self.y, self.radius, like so. And that's my hash function, which is great because now I have a hashable class. So C1 equals circle, let's say, 0, 0, 001, or I can just use the default, C2 equals circle. So I'll make another circle, right? So C1 and C2 are equal, and the hash of C1 and the hash of C2 are also equal. 
they're exactly the same numbers, which is correct, right? With hashing, if we have two objects that are equal, then the hash of each object should also be equal. And of course, what does it mean if it's hashable? Well, it means we can make a class out of it. So we can say, take the set C1, C2. Now C1 and C2 are the same object. So when we do that, first of all, because it's hashable, we can actually add it to a set. But if we look at the set itself, you can see we only retain one element because C1 and C2 are considered duplicates of each other. And then the same thing, if we have a dictionary, we can now use the keys, right? We can use circle instances as the keys of a dictionary. So in other words, we could say C1 and then let's call it circle one. And I'm not gonna use C2 because that would be exactly the same key. So now if I say D C1, I'll get that back. And of course, if I use C2, right? Well, C2 is equal to C1, so I get circle one back. But there is, of course, an issue, and it's one of mutability. If we take a look at this class, this class basically is telling the user of this class saying, hey, X, Y, and radius are mutable because they're just bare attributes and I haven't put in anything. Maybe I've got documentation that says, hey, you can't really modify this, be careful. But from the code itself, there's nothing in here that's saying, please don't modify X, Y, and radius, right? And this is a problem because normally hashable objects should be immutable. Otherwise, we run into issues and it's very easy to show you. Let's go ahead and so again, I'm just gonna take this circle class and let's go ahead and create, let's say this one. And I know these are the defaults, but I'm gonna be very explicit here so you can see what's going on. And I'm gonna create a dictionary. And I'm gonna create a dictionary saying C1, circle one, and C2, uh, sorry, I don't want this one to be equal, I apologize. Let me change that, right? I want two different circles. So I want C2 and I'll call that circle two, like so. So if we look at this dictionary, that's what we have. We have the circle 001 and the associated value is circle one and then the same thing for circle two. Now let's mutate the second circle. Let's say C2.x equals zero, C2.y equals zero. So if we look at C2, what do we have now? We have a circle with state 001. Well, guess what? C2 is now equal to C1, right? And if we look at the hash of C1 equal to the hash of C2, they also have, have the same hash now. They didn't before. I probably should have showed you that, but before they didn't. So now we've got these two keys in the dictionary, remember? We've got these. But look what happened. This is now, right? This is kind of correct because we modified the key. We mutated the state of the key. And now you can see that it's pulling back these two objects, but all this text now got messed up. This should have been circle two. It's now saying circle one. And if we try and access by key, it's gonna access who knows which one, right? But I can try accessing C1 and I get that. If I try and accessing C2, well, I get the value circle one as well. So usually we also need to require that whatever attributes in the class make up the hash function. Typically I is also used for the equality function, the equality method, and they should be immutable. So how do we make something immutable in Python? Well, we can't but we can give it a good attempt and essentially we can really represent to users of our class saying, hey, this thing is immutable, you shouldn't change it. So how do we do it? Well, we use these pseudo private variables. So I'm gonna set three pseudo private variables, done, you know, underscore X, Y, and radius. And then here, I'm gonna write properties, All right? That's one easy way. And I'm only going to write the read properties. So we'll say x self, and then we'll return self dot underscore x, and then we'll do the same thing, def y self, and then we're gonna return self dot underscore y, and then another one for the radius, right? So property def radius, 
And as you can see, this is all boilerplate code. It's not very interesting to write. It's just boring and we need to type it out and need to make sure that we don't have any, you know, typos in there. We're going to have to write unit tests. We're going to, so it causes more and more work because we're typing all this stuff out. But now that we have that, I can create a circle instance. Let's say 001. We'll do C2 circle 110, right? So now I have that. So C1 is this, C2 is that. They're different objects, they're not equal, right? C1 equals C2. And then just to show you also the hex or the ID of C1 equal to the ID of C2, right? So let me remove that ID of C1. All right, so everything is false here. But moreover, I cannot set now X because an OY or radius, because now I have essentially a read-only property, okay? So that's the best practice. If I'm writing my class myself, right? So far, what have I been doing? Well, I wanna be able to use this class in a dictionary or in a set. So I need to implement hash. If I'm gonna implement hash, I'm also gonna to need to implement the EQ method. It's better to do so, right? And then I also need to make sure that whatever I'm using for the hash is definitely going to be immutable. Otherwise it's gonna cause problems. So a lot of code that I had to write here. So again, let me ask you this question. How many times have you written a class that implements equality and hashability and forgotten to make read-only properties out of the attributes that you're using in your hash function. And even if we're aware of this, you know, and take the trouble to try and make it difficult for users of our class to inadvertently create problems by mutating the object, like using read-only properties as we did here, it's a lot of code. And, you know, more potential for typos and bugs. You're gonna need more unit testing because now you need to unit test every line of code that you write, right? You have to unit test. You don't have to unit test data classes because that's already been, been taken care of for you. So again, data classes can help us here by generating essentially all this code. Now data classes don't actually use properties like this. What data classes do is that they override the dunder set adder and dunder del adder methods in the class. And then those take care of making things mutable or immutable. So just be aware though, that data classes takes a slightly different approach to making something immutable, but it achieves the same result. And how do we do that? Well, we're going to use a data class with class circle D. So let me actually go and copy that code from where we had it before. And all I need to do here to make this class immutable I need to add a parameter to the decorator. I'm gonna say frozen equals true. And this is basically going to make every field in this class immutable. And that's all we need to do. So now I can create, let's say circle three equals circle D with the defaults. Then we'll do C4 equals circle D, let's say one, one, one and I'll do C5 equals circle D, and let's say, again, just using the defaults, like so. So now I've got these three circles. Let's see what they are. C3, C4, C5, okay. And I still have equality, just like I have, bef you know, had before, that didn't go away. So we can test C3 against C4, and C4 against C5. And of course we get false because they're not equal, but C3 on the other hand is equal to C5, okay? That's true. So again, equality just works for, uh, just fine. But now our data class circle D is immutable. I cannot go and say C3.x equals 100, which I could have done before. Now I get this frozen instance error. And because of that, by default, the data class now understands that, hey, I can actually create a hash function for this because it's immutable. So now we do have the ability to hash these various instances. And if we look, you can see that the hash for C3 is equal to the hash for C5 because C3 and C5 are equal objects. They're not the same object, right? They've got a different ID, 
but they are equal and their hash therefore is also equal. And it's possible to do that because we essentially made the class immutable. We froze it. Okay, so you can see there's a lot less code, right, doing this over here than what we had to do before with the wrapper, the EQ, and the hash. And then the properties, and then using the backing variables and all that stuff, all this kind of boilerplate code that you, that's just repetitive, right? It's not something you want to write necessarily all the time because, well, it's boring. Right? But you have to be careful because it has to be correct. The data class can take care of these kinds of plumbing issues for us. Now, another thing that we often need in our classes is ordering, right? So if I look at, let's say, I'm going to go back and use our Python class, our manually created class, and we'll do another one with circle 112, right? And then I can try and say C1 less than C2, and that's going to fail because less than is not supported between instances of circle and circle. Yeah, there's nothing that defines what it needs to be. So now we need to start implementing other special methods like the dunder LT method for less than, the dunder LE method for less than or equal to, etc. So let's do that for our custom class. And to save time on coding, on typing, I'm going to just paste that in from the notebook. So it's the same as before. We have our circle class, the init, we've got the properties, we've got the wrapper, we've got the EQ, we've got the hash. And now I have another function, right? Another method, dunder LT. And basically what it does, and the reason I'm doing this here this way is because that's how the data class does it as well. Remember that the data class for equality does this. It looks at a tuple that contains all the state variables, all the fields, and compares it to the, all the fields from the other instance. Well, it does the same thing with less than. It's going to use the less than, but it's going to do this kind of comparison. Okay, so we'll take a look at that in more detail later. But that implements the less than in our class. So now if I go back and if I take this, and recreate them using the new definition for the circle class. I have C1 less than C2, that now works, right? And C1, of course, is 001, and the tuple 001 is less than the tuple 112, hence why it returns true. Now, because of reflection, I also have C1 greater than C2. I haven't implemented the dunder GT function, but it's gonna flip it, Python is gonna flip it around and say, oh, okay, well, let's do less than, okay? So that will flip it around, and of course that returns false. But of course, I have kind of an issue here, right? This isn't best practice. If you look at what we did for the EQ class, we made sure that we were comparing two classes of the same type. Well, I really need to do the same thing here, right? So we're going to say that, return that, otherwise we're gonna return not implemented. That really is the better way of doing it. And again, let me ask you, how many times do you do it this way versus what I did the first time around over here, right? Yeah, we all take shortcuts, or maybe we don't even know that a preferable way of doing it is this. Fortunately, the data class does know and does use that. And the notebook has some additional detail on why this is kind of important to put in. I show some examples of where things can become a little funky when you don't do that. Okay, so the problem still is that we don't have, for example, so we have C1 less than C2, right? But we don't have C1 less than or equal to C2. We kind of need that too. So we would need to go and define it. And we would define it how? Well, we would write again, def underscore less than or equal to now and then self other, and then we take basically this code over here, put that in here, and then here we use less than or equal to. Then we would do probably the greater than, although we don't have to because of reflection. We may need the greater than or equal to, and so on. So that's one way of doing it. We could add a ton of code this way. Again, all just repetitive code. But another way that we could do it is also by using another decorator that is in the func tools module. So let's go ahead and do this. So from func tools, I'm gonna import total ordering. 
Okay, so that's a decorator. And if I spell it right, it will even import correctly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take exactly the same class that I had before. So I'm going to take this class over here, right? The same one we had before, but I'm going to decorate it now with total ordering. And what total ordering does, it kind of fills in the gaps. It has, it needs at least the EQ and then one of the other functions like less than. So I have less than here, so that's going to work. And so it's going to fill out basically the missing ones for the remaining, the remaining methods that we need for, you know, less than or equal to and so on. So that's what that decorator does. You can look at the Python docs if you want to know more about it. I'll also talk about it in the deep dive courses. Okay, so now that we have that, let's go ahead and create again, two instances of our class. Let's do one, one, one and zero, zero, one for C1. So now we know that C1 is less than C2, right? But now we also have C1 less than or equal to C2. That's now available. And of course, that's true. We have C2 greater than or equal to C1, etc. So now we've got all the ordering that we want defined. But of course, the ordering of these in instances is based on a tuple made up of the state, made up of the of each field in this class and in a specific order, right? The order definitely matters too. So what about data classes? Well, by default, data classes do not implement any ordering. So if we were to use the existing one that we had, circle D, and then we do that, and then C2 will make circle D111, right? Then we do not have C1 less than C2, and we don't have less than or equal to either. That's not enabled by default. But we can easily enable this in our data class this way. So again, I'm going to take this class circle D, just like we had before, and we're going to decorate it. So we're going to pass it through the data class decorator. We'll keep it frozen. So let's go ahead and keep it frozen. But now I'm going to order it as well. So now I'm going to specify order equals true. And the default that the data class is going to use to figure out the order is to use a tuple made up of the values of each field in the order in which the fields are defined in this class. So exactly the, you know what we did here when we did it ourselves. We took a tuple with self dot x, y and radius in that order. And the data class does essentially the same thing. So now we have this data class that has ordering. Let's go ahead and try it. Circle D. And then C2 equals circle D, let's do 111. And then we have C1 less than C2, like so. Okay. And then we have C1 less than or, less than or equal to C2, right? Like so. So the data class gives us that ordering kind of for free. And it won't allow you to compare to a different type. If you try and compare to a different type that's still compatible, maybe it has X, Y, and radius, maybe it's a name tuple. And I show that in the, in the notebook that's linked below. I'm not gonna do it here just to save some time. But I do show that in the notebook that it also will not allow you to compare to a different type, right? To a different class than a circle D class or a subclass of it. So the only thing to note, however, is how the ordering is defined. It's that tuple. And that may not be what we want. So that's kind of starting to limit us, right? So you're starting to see now some limitations of data classes. So we'll come back to that. So the other thing I want to talk about next very quickly is serialization to dictionaries and tuples. It's something that can be quite convenient sometimes. You know, the ability to extract the attribute values out of an instance of our class into maybe a dictionary where the keys are the attribute names and the values are the attribute values. Or maybe into a tuple that's ordered in a specific way. But the dictionary one is really kind of nice to have, especially if you're dealing with, let's say, JSON serialization. It's going to be much easier to JSON serialize a dictionary than a class, right? So the ability to extract the data from our data class into a dictionary is great. 
Now, of course, we can write this ourselves, right? But let's do it with the data class first. So from data classes, all we need to do is just to import as the function called as dict, and then we have another one called as tuple. So now we can do c1 equals circle d, right? So we just create an instance of that, and we can say as dict c1. And then we get a dictionary. You can see the, uh, the field keys and then the field values. And then if you do as tuple, you'll get essentially just the values out of that, right? So we get 0, 0, 1. Now, if we wanted something similar in our custom class, we would have to write that code ourselves. So let me show you how it would be done. And again, I'm not going to type that to save some time. But if I wanted to do it, I would now have to write this method here called as dict, and I would have to return. You know, basically, I would have to build this dictionary. And every time I change, you know, what I have here, let's say for my my you know state values, then I'd have to remember to go back in here and update this as well. And then same thing with the tuple, right? So again, a lot of boilerplate code and more and more possibilities for things you know breaking because we made a mistake. So we could of course start writing more complicated code to use introspection to figure out what are the field values or the field names, you know, extract them out of the class and then build this dictionary up. That's getting kind of complicated. We really don't need to be doing that, right? Data classes is going to do that for us. So talking of introspection, one of the interesting things also about data classes is that you can look at the fields of the data class. The data class will actually provide you a view of the fields in your class, not something that's easily doable. If you were to try and do this, as I was saying, using introspection, it's not that straightforward. But with data classes, it is. If we look at from data classes, we're going to import the fields function. So again, it's just the function that's in that module. And then we're going to say c1 equals circle d. So we're just going to create an instance. I think it's already created, but I'll recreate it. And then we're going to iterate through the fields. So for field in fields of c1, and I'm just doing that just so we get a little bit better output. So we're going to print the field and then we'll end the line with a new line, maybe a bunch of things like this to try and make a line just so we have that separation. So you can see we have three fields in C1. We have a field called X, right? So this is a field object. We'll come back to it later. We have this uh, field name. It has a default value of zero. And it's got a bunch of other stuff too that we're going to explore throughout this video and the follow-up ones. We've got Y and then we have radius. So that's the introspection that data classes gives us and that's really quite useful. Okay, so just to recap, here's the comparison between a data class, right? So we're creating a circle D class using the data class decorator. And here's the custom class that we ended up writing including the as dictionary and as tuple to try and mimic everything we had. Okay, this was the circle class. So you can see circle D and circle. So that's quite a bit of code here. And if you look also, not only is it more code, but this is very, very easy to look at this class and say, okay, I know what this class does. It's immutable, it's ordered, so, right, so if it's immutable, it's hashable, and it's got equality, by default, it's going to be based on, you know, the x, y radius tuple. I know what the fields are in this class, what the attributes are going to be. It's going to be x, y, and radius. They're integers. They have the defaults. Over here, you know, you have to read this in it, and then you have to look at the properties to realize, okay, they're read-only. Then you look at your wrapper. Then you might look at your eek, and then suddenly it's like, okay, wait a minute, there's lt as well. Oh, there's an as dict, right? It's the, the amount of noise that you have around this particular way of creating our circle class and the you know amount of no noise that we have around the way of building the same circle class essentially, but using the data class decorator. 
Now, data classes are just regular classes, right? We saw that it's just a regular class, but we pass it to the decorator, it modifies it and returns the class back. So this means that we can add whatever we want to that class. So for example, let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna add two things to that class. So I'm going to import uh, pi from math, right? So this is the same data class we had before, frozen, ordered, circle, x, y, radius but this is just a regular Python class. I'm gonna add a property. This is gonna be a calculated property. It's just gonna return pi r squared. Then I'm gonna make a method called circumference. I would probably make it a property too, but I'm just trying to illustrate that here I have a property, here I've got a regular method and so on. And here I'll return two pi r for the radius, uh, for the circumference. So now we can say c equals circle d, right? And I can say c dot area that is again available here because, well, I created the property, nothing's changed, right? This, this is no different than a regular class. And then if we look at circumference, and then of course it's a method, so I need to call it, and I get the circumference of the circle. All right, so given that, it means that we can add whatever we want to the data class, which means that we can also override the special Dunda methods. So let's go back to our ordering of the circles. And we saw how the default ordering that data classes define for our circles wasn't ideal. Let's say that I really want to define ordering between circles in one of two ways. Let's say that I'm interested in these ways of sorting my circles based on the radius only and based on maybe the distance from the origin. So these are two different ways, right? I'm not saying combine those, two different ways that we might want to you know, implement sorting for this class. Now, there is no way currently that I know of to completely customize the sort order key function in data classes. You can specify, and we'll take a look at that later, whether a field should be included or not in the comparison tuple, right? So it will change the EQ, but it will also change, of course, the sort order by doing that. So doing a comparison based only on the radius would be possible using the native functionality of data classes, but it's going to affect the equality. And now it's like, well, you know, that's not exactly what I want. I still want to consider two circles equal if they have the same center and radius, but I want to order the circles based only on the radius or only on the distance from the origin, not mucking around, you know, changing what EQ means. I do not believe there's a way to do that with data classes today. Now you can, however, do that using the Atas library. Remember I said the Atas library was essentially a superset of data classes. It basically has the same kind of you know, deals that the data classes have, but then a lot more on top of that, including the ability to have a custom key. So if you're interested in that, I have a link in the notebook that links you to the actual function that you can use uh, it's called comp using, and you can use that attribute in the Atas library to have these very customized sort keys. So instead, what we can do now, instead of trying to fight the data class, well, this is just a regular class. So let's go ahead and do our own sort. So I'm going to take the data class, I'm going to make it frozen, and to the data class, I'm gonna add the LT function, the less than function. So remember now, I haven't mucked around with anything else, which means that my equality is still going to be based on X, Y, and radius. It's frozen, so it's gonna be hashable, and the hash will also be based on the X, Y, and radius. But now, in addition, I'm starting to define ordering myself using a custom thing. So I might use this distance between the origin and the center of the circle to the other one, right? And of course, um, I need to return not implemented here. So if we look at this, so now if I create C1 equals circle D and then C2 equals circle D, so let's be explicit so we know. So I'm here I'm gonna put a circle of radius, let's say one, uh, centered at one, one, and here I'm gonna put something that's a little further away from the origin. Remember now I'm ordering based on the distance from the origin. So I'll make it further away, I'll put it at two, two, and I'll make, let's say the radius one as well. 
And in fact, just to show you that the radius has nothing to do with it, we'll make that radius two. So if we look at that, you can see that we have C1 is less than C2 is now true. Now, of course, we need to implement the other methods too, right? We don't have C1 is less than or equal to C2. That's not implemented. But we saw that we can use total ordering. So if the data class is just a regular class, can I just apply total ordering to it? I mean, I can do that with data classes after all. And so, yes, the answer is yes. So we're going to take this class, just like we had before. So it's exactly the same. But now I'm going to add the decorator total ordering, like so. And if we do this and we repeat what we had over here, right? So let's take those two. So now I have C1 less than or equal to C2 is available as well. C1 greater than or equal to C2 is available as well. It's been implemented, okay? So a question that you might have is which way should we do this? Should we put total ordering before or after? Well, this is where knowing what the code looks like for the data class would actually be helpful, but we don't, right? So I don't know what, the, and there's nothing in the documentation for data classes that indicates, you know, if you're going to do this, which order should you do it in? I don't think it matters in this case. So we can put total ordering either before or after. I personally would probably put it before because I kind of think of the data class as something that takes an existing class and then adds some stuff to it. So to be on the safe side, I'd probably want to add everything I want to my class first and then pass it through the data class decorator. Okay, so I would probably write it this way, but I'm not convinced that one is particularly better than the other for this particular use case. So if we just run it this way, you'll see everything works exactly the same. Everything works correctly. All right. So another thing that we can talk about is, you know, keyword only arguments to the init method, right? We can customize our init method to require certain arguments to be keyword only. Now, this is probably a pretty bad example with the circle class because there's nothing here that really warrants being you know a keyword only argument but i'm going to do it anyway just to show you so here i've got x and y which are positional arguments then i have a star that indicates no more positionals and now radius which therefore becomes a keyword only argument to the init so when i do this this means that when i create my class i have to use you know a keyword a named argument for the radius so I have to say C1 equals circle. I can certainly pass it 1, 1 positionally, but then I have to pass it the radius using a named argument. So that will work just fine, as you can see, right? This is our custom class. But if I try and make a circle with, let's say, 1, 1, 2, that is not going to work because I need the positional arguments. So we can actually do the, you know, get to the same result in data classes by using something to indicate in our attribute declarations a boundary between the positional and the keyword only arguments. And that's one way of doing it. I'll show you another way much later on. So let's go ahead and we're going to need, so from data classes, we're going to import the KW only constant, essentially. It's not a constant, it's actually a type. So we're going to import that type. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same data class that we had before. So let's go grab it from wherever it was. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to grab this one because it had the total ordering. I'm going to leave the total ordering out because I don't want to repeat that here to muddy the waters. So I'm just going to copy that from the notebook. So basically I took my original data class, right? So my circle D class that I passed through the data class with X, Y, and radius. And I want to make radius keyword only. All I need to do is to insert over here, you know, another field. And I can name the field whatever I want, but the name of it doesn't matter because it's not going to be included at the end of the day once the circle D class has been turned, right, has been transformed by the data class decorator, that field 
isn't going to be um, kept. It will disappear. And that's because it has this type KW only. So it's pretty customary when we have a variable that we don't really care about. We just use the underscore. That's a valid legal you know, variable name in Python. And it usually means I don't really care what this variable is. And in fact, we don't because we're only using this to separate essentially just like we use the star over here, right? To separate, to say, these are the positionals. And now from this point forward, we have the keywords or the keyword only arguments. Same thing that this does here. So now I can go ahead and create a circle D just you know using all the defaults, that's fine. But if I want to specify the radius, right, then I could specify, let's say, one and one for X and Y using positional values. And now I would be forced to use a named argument for radius. If I try and do one, one, two, you'll see we'll get an exception. We get this type error that it takes one to three positional arguments, but four were given. Now, of course, you can always pass everything as a named argument, right? There's nothing wrong with passing it this way. And then, of course, the order in which you do it, we could say y equals 1, x equals 0, and if we want to keep the same values, like so, and then radius equals 2. And then I could even put radius right in the beginning, too. Right? You know that from standard Python. So we, of course, can pass all that to the init method. Now, if we want to make everything keyword only, which means that we would have to, you know, create instances of the circle class using named arguments, so we want to force that usage, then that's even easier. You basically take this, and then we're going to remove this over here, and then we add another parameter to the data class decorator, right, to the de data class decorator factory, because it's a decorator factory. If you don't know what decorator factories are, I have a video on that in this channel. And all we need to do is to say keyword only equals true, like so. And now all of them become keywords. So if I try and do what I did before, that will work just fine, like so, right? If we look at C, we get X was one, Y was zero, radius was two. But if we try and create the circle D instance passing zero, zero, one, not gonna work because Right, we only gave it one positional argument, the self, right, because it was bound, but four were given. Yeah, we gave it three positional arguments, and it says, no, I don't want that, right? And if you're confused by this thing about it takes one positional argument, but four were given, when clearly there should be no positional arguments, I've got a little explanation of that in the notebook that's linked below. Okay, the other thing that I want to talk about very quickly now is the resource utilization and performance. And I stated right in the beginning that I wasn't going to compare data classes, name tuples, adders, and pydantic objects. Um, however, I have come across people that categorically reject name tuples and will only use data classes. I actually had a kind of a short conversation in one of my YouTube videos on that. And my initial kind of very knee-jerk reaction was along the lines of, well, this is just a person that's got a shiny new hammer and everything therefore looks like a nail. And that's something that usually I reserve when I'm talking about meta classes. But here I was thinking the same thing, saying, why is this person saying that they're just going to use data classes all the time? You know, they don't care about name tuples. I've been so ingrained to using name tuples and data classes to me was a kind of a different beast altogether. The name tuple was immutable, data classes could be mutable, they could also be immutable. So I was kind of like, my knee-jerk reaction was like, nah, you know, that's, that's just not right. Just use a name tuple when you're returning something, you know, from a function, for example. That's where we use name tuples typically. Do that and then keep data classes for the other stuff. And the reason I was thinking that is, well, there's a performance impact, right, to the data class. It seems like there's a lot more code that's written for data class. It's got to have much more of a performance impact. So after that initial knee-jerk reaction, I decided to take a step back and say, well, I don't know that for sure. Let's actually try it out. Let's see. Is it really, you know, that much more, you know, performance 
uh, and, and, and resource utilization, is it that much more worse using data classes than named tuples? So let me switch to the notebook that's in the repo and just show you the results. I'm not gonna go through that. We already have a long video. So I'm just going to give you the highlights where basically I tried different things, different approaches. So I had name tuples done in you know two different ways, one using the collections name tuple, the other one using the name tuple from the typing, right? That's got the type hinting as well. And it has also the defaults, although you have defaults for the name tuple here as well. I just didn't use them. So I went through and then I created different data classes with slots, without slots. If you don't know what slots are, I suggest you just you know try doing a quick read on the web somewhere. Basically, it's a more efficient way of storing data for the state of an instance that doesn't use that dictionary. So when you have a an instance of a class that's been defined using slots, you don't have a data dictionary available on that class anymore. That's gone. And that data is stored elsewhere. And of course, I talk about slots extensively also in my deep dive course, and you have access to all the notebooks in GitHub. So I looked at also different ways of creating the data classes, with slots, without slots, frozen, not frozen, and then the two combinations thereof. And then I basically timed a number of things. And let's just look at the results, the final results. So here's what we had, right? So I had a tuple that came from a name tuple from the collections. I had a tuple that used the name tuple here class from the typing module. I had a data class that was mutable. I had a data class that was mutable with slots. I had a data class that was frozen and a data class that was frozen with slots. And then I looked at the size, the memory that's used by each one of those. And it was a pretty, you know, simple class, but I wanted to see the difference. I was expecting a much higher number. And in fact, if you look, if you look at the slots, because we can use slots with data class, you actually end up using a little bit less. I mean, and of course it's only eight bytes, but this was kind of small, you know, classes, not a whole lot of data in it. So this was, I thought to me, that was a little bit interesting, but okay about the same size. So I'm not really, you know, seeing a performance penalty of using a data class versus a, a named tuple. In fact, they seem to be perfectly equal, right? Then I wanted to test, well, how long does it take to create an instance? Because very often named tuples you might, you know, use, let's say when you're returning data from a database, you might want to take each row and put it into a named tuple so that you can then access the data using dot notation instead of using an index number, right? That's a way that I use it very often. So I wanted to know, well, how long does it take to create the name tuple? I always thought, well, the name tuple is gonna be faster because it's a tuple. Well, it's not exactly just a tuple, right? It's actually inheriting from tuple. It's got, it's, it's also a code generator. It's also doing its own thing. And so surprisingly, the creation of data classes except when you have frozen with slots. So, you know, if it's frozen, it's a little bit worse. So if you require a frozen entity, then maybe a name tuple might be better, you know, and in terms, certainly in terms of creating, you know, the, the creating the, the, the instance of the name tuple might be a little bit better than the data class. But look at this, I can create a, a mutable data class with or without slots, and it's way faster than creating the name tuple. So that, you know, that, to me, that's another win for the, for the data class right here. And then the other third thing that's really important is how fast can you read an attribute or a field value right back from the object? And again, I also thought incorrectly, as it turns out, that name tuple access was gonna be faster. And in fact, it's not. It looks like accessing, you know, reading a value from the data class is faster than reading a value back by name, right? Not by index, but by name from the name tuple. So overall, I have to say that, you know, the person who was, who, you know, and, and other people as well, who were saying that they're only using data classes and they're just not gonna use name tuples moving forward. Yeah, I can understand why now. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And I'm seeing less and less need for a named tuple. Now, you may know something that 
I don't, or you may find maybe I made a mistake in how I'm timing these things. I mean, I don't know if, if I did and you spotted that, please you know, let us know in the comments. But at this point, yeah, I mean, am I gonna switch to data classes where I was using name tuples before for return values of functions? No, I, I mean, probably not. I kind of like this approach to doing very, very simple definitions for name tuples. It's a single line. I got a point, three elements in my name tuple. It's as simple as can be, right? The data class, you know, is a little bit more complicated to write than this. If I'm not really worried about performance or about memory overhead, yeah, I'm gonna keep using the name tuple simply because I like this syntax over here. When it comes to the other things, yeah, I mean, you know, I am thinking data classes more and more. All right, so I think this is enough for one video. It's probably really, really long. So in conclusion, we saw how to create data classes. We kind of saw how to write the equivalent things, right, in regular classes, just using the long approach to it, the, you know, the long boilerplate definitions of methods and properties and so on that we had to do, how much easier it was using the data class approach. We saw that sometimes you gotta start fighting the data class. Like if you want a custom sort key that's different from the equality, right? That starts getting, now you're starting to fight this data class. And I'll come back and have more to say about that in the future. And of course now there's a lot more customizations we can do. This was really just the basics of data classes. We can add a lot more fine-grained customizations by adding declarations to the fields that are defined in the data class body. There's a few more options in the data class decorator. There's a special method available for, for data classes that happens post init. So this is a kind of another method that's in the life cycle of the creation of an instance. We also have the option to add more documentation to each field in the data class, in essentially metadata, and as well as a few other odds and ends. So for all the functionality we saw with data classes, keep in mind that this is basically a subset of what's available in the Atters library. So if you're looking for something that's got a lot more functionality than data classes, then you can look at the third party Adders library. Of course, it's an external dependency now, so you need to you know, keep that into your project. It needs to be installed in the virtual environment and so on. Okay, so this is more than enough for a single video. So I'm gonna leave things here and then I'm gonna come back with a second installment on these more advanced features of data classes in the near future. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching.